I'm Alicia, and I'm going to be your host for this podcast series. And in these first few minutes, I just wanted to give a bit more of context about who I am, what am I doing, why am I doing it, why I'm doing this uh, podcast series, and what's it going to be about. Uh, it will probably vary throughout the journey because it's not a finished thing or intention it's more a part of a process and it's a part of my research so the motivation for doing this, this podcast is because I started doing a PhD about three years ago I do it in the Tallinn University of Technology and I wanted to make my learnings extensive to other people that are interested in these topics as well and without them having to go and read academic papers so that's my motivation and also because I'm a part uh, currently I'm a partner of the greater than collective and I believe and we're self-organized so we distribute power in our organization and I strongly believe that we need more prototypes like greater than is of a very different type of organization. An organization where we introduce feminist uh, principles in which we take ecology into account and put it at the center and stop having this anthropocentric understanding that we have of organizations um, it's an organization in which we experiment a lot and learn and yeah, I just think it's, uh, and of, although of course it has its challenges and we don't do everything in a perfect way, I still think that there is so much value in this experimentation and in being in a different type of relationship than what we're used to. To being in most, definitely in all other professional contexts, I haven't seen. I have seen, uh, but I know there are a lot more. So, I want to foster these types of collectives, and what I'm having a look at is the intersection of self-organizing and emotions, because I think it's one that, in my opinion, has not been looked at enough and that I think that we have so much to learn in our collectives. We work a lot with structures and processes and we have, for example, we have a handbook where you can find loads of um, tips and tricks on how to organize and make agreements and make decisions in a way that is also very different from the mainstream. And still, also in this way of organizing or in all other framings I have found about self-organizing, we talk about these different areas of self-organizing and decision-making, uh, conflict resolution, roles, um, tools. And, and then this one is usually called culture, for example. But in my experience, you do need all of those things. You need all of those processes and structure for self-organizing to work because it's about making power explicit. So it needs to be made tangible and needs to be distributed in an intentional way. And at the same time, I think that another crucial aspect of self-organizing are emotions and the relationships between people, how we relate. And I think that on the first hand, in order for that to fill up its potential of different ways of being together, I don't think, I honestly don't think you can do that in traditional settings. For example, a traditional hierarchical organization. And at the same time, even if you're self-organized, if we don't learn to relate differently, then I think that we're not reaching the potential that we can through self-organizing. And we will talk about all of this throughout the series, but just to explain what my motivation is. And I think that some of the things that I will say or you will hear in the series, they might come across as super basic. And of course, like for example, 
that emotions in in let's say in the research I call that effect. So effect and cognition go hand in hand, and you need emotions to make decisions. You need emotions for sense making processes, and you need emotions in order to engage in conflict transformation. Of course, this is super obvious, right? I guess that we will we would all agree. And at the same time, I have barely ever seen this done right. I'm aware I said um, the expression, um, say that we relate with each other in the, um, to relate with each other in the right way. And I'm aware that just by saying that it's actually wrong, then it's not there's no one right way of being together or of relating. Wrong thinking, Alicia. But uh, what I mean to say is to find a way that works for a specific context, a specific group of people to relate in a regenerative and healthy way, which I guess both would need, need to be defined as well. What does that mean for that specific context? But yeah, just to correct myself. And I think that that's the trick how, and I think that uh, at an individual level, sometimes we have these hints of how it could be in a different way. Sometimes we have this with another person that we're able to, to practice, but how do you bring this into a collective and what are the practices, the language or lack thereof that you develop in order to engage in a different way and be able to give space for emotions in all of these processes. And that's all the organizational processes that are necessary. And in case you think you're already doing this or this is taken for granted, I would just invite you to a reflection. Maybe I'm explaining it wrong, but it's just the story of my life that I talk about the things that I do and people say, oh, I'm already doing that. And I'm like, I'm sure you're not. <laughs> Especially, again, if you're in a traditional setting. And if you're in a self-organized one, my experience is that it's, it's super rewarding. It's the joy of my life. And at the same time, I think that it's just so challenging because we inherit all of these ways of doing and being of the mainstream. And then they don't really match in how we want to live. And at the same time, we don't know um, what our these other ways of being that we could have. And of course, I'm exaggerating. We do have loads of practices and it's not only great to them. Um, there are loads of networks and collectives and communities that have a very developed um, way of being together. And the idea here is to learn from those practices that work to understand the theory underlying that and to make it available to many more collectives. I also think that it's not that it's of course it's not a linear journey there's not the end where we do everything perfectly and i think that's partially because why it's so um challenging at least for me i think that for other people that think but differently for sure uh, that will not be that big a challenge but for me it is challenging when i think oh how can we do this right and then of course something else happened in the in the journey and you have to um, reshuffle again and adapt and it's um yeah it's waves it's it's a journey so yeah I hope that you will get some learning and concepts that can be interesting for you I will try to link all the papers so that if you want to know more you're able to go directly to the paper that talks about that topic and you don't have to uh, look around in the seas of literature that there are and um, and yeah, I also, and I understand that this is a communication that goes from the podcast um, to you, but I would be very happy to receive comments, questions, to learn about what is it that uh, you are doing in your community, network, collective, and that this is more of a conversation starter for what it can be that we can learn all together. I think there's a lot, a lot to do. So this is the reason why I'm interested in this intersection, my motivation. And 
yeah what else i think that i mean i wanted to share some terminology i'm not sure it's that relevant um and that we do explain in the episodes themselves uh, what those terms are in case you need them to um to understand what we're talking about maybe the um, a relevant thing would be to a very brief differentiation between effect and emotions and in the paper i write about effect because i'm based on effect theory but i use these words quite interchangeably i have to say there's something though about effect um that is it's the pre-reflective step of an emotion according to um effect theory and it happens between uh, bodies so human and non-human so it's about an interaction with another person or another being it can be an animal it can be a tree anything in in nature and that provokes uh, a body reaction on you so for example I use um goosebumps it's like i think that one of the easiest uh, examples so something happens interacting with another body let's say and you get goosebumps and we would say that the emotion is then when you are already using the constructs of our society to make sense of that thing that just happened um, to you again not everyone agrees with this uh, differentiation it depends on what theories you're having a look at but that's my framing to navigate the differentiation between those two terms. And the, the thing about effect and emotions is that I said effect happens between two bodies and emotion could be something that happens individually. And I think that that's why it's especially important in the context of communities, collectives, networks in which by relating, it's a process of becoming, of developing, unfolding everyone's um, identity as well and, and, and group identity. So that's, um, and I think that also that's one of the reasons why is the concept of effect uh, works better. This might have been interesting for you or not, or, or just confusing, but it was just important for me to make this explicit. And then I, do talk about self-organizing. I said before, this is the intersection between self-organizing and affect slash emotions we could use. And self-organizing, I understand it. I use the um, definition loose, used by Lee and Edmondson, which is the radical distribution of power throughout the whole organization. So it's not about a certain department or a team, but it is radical. So it is complete. It's everyone co-deciding through processes. So maybe it's not everyone deciding everything. That's not what I mean. But everyone is um, in the framing of deciding how we organize. And this includes what purpose we have, what values we have, what direction we want to go. Etc. So that's the understanding I'm taking of self-organizing. So let's say that's one extreme. If we say false dichotomy, but anyway, hierarchical organizations and self-organizing. So complete distribution of power, centralized um, power in the hierarchy. So I'm talking about this area over here. Yeah, and that's where I see as a, as Great Tanan and then many other of the networks and. Um, communities I have been part of in in the past. That's what we try to develop. And as said, this is um, a journey as well for me and my research. So we will start with episode one with uh, Elena Denaro, a colleague of mine, with whom I review the paper as it was when I talked to her in July, 2023. Now me recording these, it's already November of the same year, 2023. And my paper has changed a lot already. So the logic as well somehow, and especially uh, in that call with Elena, I got to understand a part of, um, let's say the framing that I was using 
that was not accurate enough and I realized while talking to her and that allowed me to completely flip uh, my research and bring it to somewhere else. So from there, now I'm looking for other people or to do another episode to talk about the, the stage and the new concepts that I have been able to uh, bring in the research. So I cannot tell you, you know, how many episodes there will be or what topics we will be visiting specifically. What I can tell you is that it's a journey between theory and practice, um, because that's the intersection I'm working on and that I am interested in. Uh, I'll, I've tried to make it as practical as possible. And at the same time, with some of the interviewees, we do go into more um, abstract understandings that for me, theory and abstraction, it gives me the possibility of understanding how would things be maybe in an ideal scenario, maybe in the, let's say, pure definition of something, even if it's not applicable. But that idea, that abstraction, it gives me freedom to understand that maybe our practice is in one specific way. So we have adopted one practice, but that's just the strategy. It could also take a complete different form and we could be talking about decision making now or about conflict transformation or sense making but understanding the theory allows me to think about possibilities and I'm not even talking about me coming up with anything I find actually that many of the frame or most of the framings we're working with there's a lot of wisdom in them and a lot of that wisdom comes um, from networks like Inspiral, for example, um, but actually greater than is a spin-off of. And, but it allows me to understand why is it done in this way and to understand what are the missing pieces or the things that I think I, I want to complement when um, I'm explaining this to someone else or, or I'm reflecting about Okay, so why is this practice and why it's important? And uh, for example, about decision making, if I find that we're making a decision and I start feeling some dissent, how am I navigating this? And if I understand, for example, that dissent is a key part of consent decision making, for example, that I'm able to reflect on this and think, okay, yes, this is part of the process. It makes sense to spend time thinking about this and if I'm not able to make the full reflection myself I can I have the vocabulary to go and talk to a colleague of mine and say hey there is this decision I'm feeling some dissent like it's not um yeah it's just not working for me the way it is and then they can help me understanding like in what parts or in what way and then I can make my informed decision so I think that all of these um, is key to, like all of these, all of these abstractions are key to improve our practice and remind ourselves why those are important. So I hope that these episodes are helpful and they can um, add something to your practice in self-organizing, or if you come from the theory, maybe um, help you see some, some of the applications um, that he has. So yeah, I'm also curious to know where the this journey will take us and at the end, what types of topics uh, we will be dealing with. So yeah, and in between um, this, and maybe that would be important to add, my idea would be to do the episodes based on interviews with practitioners, with uh, researchers. And every now and then I might be doing some of these check-ins um, adding any information or talking about the uh, inflections um, in the process, things that happened, interesting turns. Inflection point. That's what I actually mean. Not an inflection. Point I didn't add is that as it's become obvious to you probably, English is not my mother tongue. My mother tongues are Catalan and Spanish. And uh, yeah, let's take it from here. And I hope that you enjoy these episodes as much as I have been um, enjoying having these 
conversations. Thank you for being here. <laughs>